Thank you. I don't know if the sound is okay. Can you hear me at the back? Is that fine? Thank you. Okay, so uh, this is a rather provocative title. I'm often told I'm challenging, and it's, people seem to assume that I actually set out to wind people up, but I really don't. I, I just seem, I, I just find things that find, I find interesting, I share them with people, and some people find that challenging. That's the way it is, I guess. So what I want to convince you of is that um, I, I want to talk about what it might mean for a profession to be research-based. I want to show you why I think education falls short of that ideal. Uh, I want to spend a little bit of time then um, what I think educational research can and should do. And I want to spend a little time right at the very end thinking about the role of teachers in this process. So it seems to me that in a research-based profession, professionals would, for the majority of decisions they need to take, be able to find and access credible research studies that provided evidence that particular courses of action that would, implemented as directed, be substantially more likely to lead to better outcomes than others. That's my definition of what it would mean to be research-based. And we could spend some time going through each of those conditions. So, for example, we've recently been talking about getting teachers access to journal studies. That's a straightforward thing to arrange. The trouble is that, you know, when teachers go to the educational research cupboard, the cupboard is generally bare. And one of the problems is that incentives aren't very well aligned in the system. And I'll talk about what we can do that late, about that later on. But it seems to me that that is what a reasonable defini definition of what it would mean to be research-based. And I don't think we come even close to that. I don't think teachers could have the majority of the decisions they're taking in the course of a day informed by research. And you know, we're always held up. Um, against medical research, for example. So educational research is often compared, compared unfavorably with medical research. And, you know, medical research, if you listen to Ben Goldtaker this afternoon, you'll hear there's a lot of problems with that. But, you know, we've done, made quite a lot of progress in working out how to treat certain conditions. Here's what's interesting. 40% of GPs admit to prescribing antibiotics for viral-based conditions. Things they... They prescribe drugs that they know will have no effect because it makes people feel that they've got a prescription in their hand as they walk out. They feel they've been heard. They feel they have a solution. Some doctors are much better than others at getting patients to adhere to drug regimes. So what I'm saying is that when we, when we compare medical research and education research, and education research comes up, up short, that's usually because we're actually comparing the successes of medical education research, medical research with the failures of education research. And when you look at the reality in doctor surgeries, it's very messy. How do you get people taking their drugs? How do you get people taking more exercise? Those things are very messy, and medical research hasn't made much progress there. The other thing I want to stress is that educational research can only tell us what might be. Uh, by the way, these slides are all available. I've already uploaded them to my website, dylanwilliam.net. You have to spell my name correctly. It only has one L in my last name. How many L's do you need? <laughs> so for example, the research on homework shows that most homework does no good. But then most of, the most, most of the homework the teachers set is crap. So what the research really shows is that crap homework does no good. Big shock there. But what the research also shows is that the homework the teachers set most frequently is the least effective. Preparation for future learning is actually the most effective form of homework. It's just very much more difficult to organize. So the fact that people have said that the homework research shows that homework doesn't do any good doesn't mean homework can't be good. In education, what works, which is what politicians would love to know about, is not the right question, because in education, everything works somewhere and nothing works everywhere. The interesting question is, under what conditions does this work? So, we need to prove a causal relation. You know, we know that with, with um, anything in social science, correlation is not causation. We need to establish causality. And, you know, David Hume, I think, probably said it as well as anybody in slightly archaic language in 1748. Um, David Lewis more recently said that if C and E are two actual events such that E would not have occurred without C, then C is a cause of E. So we have to prove a causal relationship. The difficulty is that ultimately, proving a causal relationship is a counterfactual claim. What you want to be able to say is that because we did this, this resulted, and had we not done this, it wouldn't have resulted. 
So, what we typically do is correlation research, given C, the cause, E happened. The problem there, of course, is that, as the Latin phrase says, post hoc ergo propter hoc. The mistake is, if it's after the event, it's therefore because of the event. So, the counterfactual claim, if C had not happened, E would not have happened, but the problem is C did happen. So we need to create a parallel world. Do, 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 do. Um, we need to create a parallel, wor par uh, uh, parallel world where C did, the cause did not happen. Now you could do the same group at a different time, but the problem is then, you have to assume stability over time. The idea that we actually resort to most of the time is a control group. We, we actually have two groups. The control group stands in for what would have happened had we not treated the experimental group to the experiment. And that's the logic of randomized control trials. I want to make it clear, I think randomized control trials are wonderful. I've even done some in my, in my own work. If you can do randomized control trials, you should do so. Because they actually provide a very strong, but not perfect, warrant for causal inferences. Oops. Uh, I want to stress some of the problems with randomized control trials. First is educational data is clustered. If you want to use the, the mechanisms of statistical inference, you have to assume that students in a particular treatment are independent of each other, and apart from the treatment they received. And the fact is that in education, that rarely is the case, because you've got 30 kids being taught by the same teacher. So those kids' experiences aren't randomly independent. Now, that, I'm quite worried about the study I've just heard about, because they've got we heard about a study with 30 schools in the control group, 30 schools in the experimental group. I don't know whether that experiment is big enough to have a significant effect. This is the second point, statistical power. Statistical power is the chance that we actually find a big enough effect, if it's there. Is our experiment big enough to capture this? If we have a, bu a slightly biased coin, and we toss it ten times, we get six heads and four tails, it might be, that might be evidence that it's biased, but the problem is, it might not. It could just be a chance variation. If we throw it a thousand times and get 600 heads and 400 tails, then I think we're on much safer ground concluding that the coin is biased. So the size of the experiment matters. And the problem is, in education, the size of the experiment is hardly ever the student. It's often the number of teachers in the experiment. And because teachers talk to each other in the staff room, it can, it's generally the number of schools. To get independence in your assumptions, you need to have different schools participating you have one school in the treatment group, one school in the experimental group, your experiments get very big. Um, power, so implementation. One of the really interesting things is that teachers do not do as they're told. It's quite funny, that. So a number of randomized control trials, very expensive randomized control trials, have been conducted in the US. And hardly any of them have produced significant results. So, for example, Rick Stiggins wrote a book called Classroom Assessment for Student Learning, CASL. And a randomized controlled trial was undertaken of this, and they randomized at the school level. They did it absolutely right. Unfortunately, they found a, nut, an, a zero effect. The point is that the effect wasn't big enough to be statistically significant. They then discovered that not a single teacher in the study had, re required, had received the required amount of time. So the program specified 100 hours of professional development. The average was about 60. And so because these people hadn't been given time to work through the materials, what all you proved is that if you do not reproduce an intervention, you are unlikely to get its benefits. And it turns out that getting people actually to do this in a complex system like a school is very difficult. And then finally, I want to say something about context. Context is really important. We can say that yeast causes bread to rise. But yeast only causes, you know, do the causality thing. Delete the yeast, the bread no longer rises. So therefore, the yeast is a cause of the bread rising. But the yeast only causes bread to rise in the presence of moisture and heat and a whole row of other factors which you don't understand that well, including the right amount of salt. And so, for example, we might get a randomized controlled trial which shows an effect, but we have to understand the context. Let me give you an example. I did some work in Trenton, in New Jersey, which is where, near where I live now in the US. And we wanted to help their high school improve the graduation rate from the school. And in New Jersey, kids have to take a test called the High School Proficiency Assessment, usually called the HESPA. And the success rate in, this, in 
Trenton Central High School was, for the HESPA was about 17%. So it was the second lowest rate in the entire state. And we went to talk to these teachers to find out what was going wrong, and we found that these, these teachers didn't actually help kids by teaching them the things that were going to come up on the HESPA. So these kids were taking a test which determined whether they actually got a high school diploma or not, but the teachers weren't teaching the test because they were teaching their own curriculum. And we said, well, why, why don't you prepare the kids for the test? They said, that would be teaching to the test. It's kind of a strange notion. So we actually produced an intervention to help them align what they were doing in the classroom with what was likely to come up on this test. And in two years, we improved the graduation rate for young people in Trenton by 40%. But the point is, that intervention only worked because of what the teachers were not doing. In another school, where teachers were already well aligned to the outcome measures, this would have had no benefit at all. If you don't understand the context in which you're implementing a solution, you can't be, conclude that it's going to work elsewhere. So I think randomized control trials can be very powerful, but they're also hugely pro problematic, even when they're well conducted and implemented. Um, I now want to take a little swipe at meta-analysis. Um, people often cite the big publication that Paul Black and I wrote about formative assessment in 1998 as a meta-analysis, and that, shows, that just shows they haven't read it, because section 8 of the paper is called No Meta-Analysis. So, and uh, a little bit of homage to, to Ben Goldhage, who was on this afternoon. Um, I think you'll find it's a bit more complicated than that. And as a remark to say to people, whenever they talk about education research, you're almost always correct in saying, I think you'll find it's a bit more complicated than that. So you've seen this, the Education Endowment Foundation's toolkit and feedback, which tops the list. I'm going to come back to feedback in a minute. Um, I like this list because it shows that the things I've been talking about, like feedback, students owning their own learning, and students helping each other, come out as the top three. I want to go over to um, the last few pages of this. This is slowing down slightly, I think. No, it's died. I'll have to do it manually. Okay, teaching assistants have no impact on student achievement, apparently. But then in most schools, teaching assistants are deployed thoughtlessly. The teachers they work with don't get time to plan with them what they're going to do. In many schools, because I do insert with schools a lot, the teaching assistants are excluded from staff development days because it costs extra to pay them to be there. So this comes back to this idea of education research will, will never tell you what might be. It only tells you what was. Ability grouping is presumed here to have a negative effect. Typically, the research on ability grouping shows that ability grouping gains, results in gains for the highest achievers at the expense of losses for the lowest achievers. And typically, the losses for the lowest achievers are greater than the gains for the highest achievers, so the net effect is to slightly lower student achievement. But as the work that I did with Joe Bowler and Margaret Brown in London schools showed, the fact is that some of the things that happen in ability grouping aren't necessarily to do with ability grouping. So for example, what we saw were two things. We saw curriculum polarization. We saw set ones going far too fast and teachers saying things to kids like, well, you should be able to do this, you're set one. So they were completely ignoring what the kids could actually do. They were saying, well, you're set one kids. Set one kids should be able to do this. And so what typically happened, we saw girls in particular wanting to be moved down to set two because they wanted to understand what they were doing and they couldn't understand what they were doing because the teacher kept on going too fast. So set one goes too fast. Set eight, and there were some set eights we found, tends to go too slowly. We're not clear why this is, but one mechanism that seems to be important is the teacher's reference group. Teachers always cue I mean, you have to do this to survive. Teachers cue their lessons on certain students. You kind of, these are the students you go to to see whether this is working or not. And in the mixed ability group, it's often the ones in the middle. In the top sets, it's often the highest achievers. And in the bottom sets, it may well be one of the ones who are most likely to kick up and make a fuss. So what happens is the top set goes too fast. And this is a, quite a general finding, going back to the work of Charles de Forge, the bottom set goes too slowly. So the sets move apart. So we say to kids, ah, well, if you work well in set two, you can go back into set one. But they can't. Because within a couple of months, set one is so far ahead of set two 
that the kid wouldn't make that transition. There's a wonderful episode of The Simpsons where Bart is put in a special class to help him catch up, and he says, let me get this straight. We're going to catch up with the other kids by going slower than them. <laughs> the other thing that we saw was the best teachers were given to the top sets. And now, of course, this research was six or seven years ago. Now it's more likely to be the middle sets. But it's hardly ever the case that schools systematically group kids by ability in order to give the best teachers to the lowest achieving students, which would actually be quite a smart thing to do. Because it turns out that the best teachers have more of an impact on lower achieving students than higher achieving students. So by definition, the good teachers are the ones whose kids learn more. But the difference is greater for the lowest achievers. So, you know, if schools adopted ability grouping as a way of getting the best teachers to the students who need them most, then it might well be different from this result. It might be a substantial plus. It's political suicide, of course, because the reason that parents like ability grouping so much is middle class parents assume their kids are going to be in the top set. Try saying to a bunch of parents, yes, we, 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 do, we do setting in maths in this school. Uh, we make sure, of course, that the best teachers are given to the bottom sets. Do you still want us to set by ability? No, I thought not. I want to come back to this point about feedback. So feedback tops the hit parade in the Education Endowment Foundation's tool toolkit. Let's look in more detail at the research. Kluger and Denisi reviewed 3,000 research reports on the effects of feedback in schools, colleges, and workplaces. This is an extraordinary piece of work. They went back to 1905 and tracked down a copy of every single research study on the effects of feedback published in the English language. Some of them didn't have control groups. They were just people tested before and afterwards. Why is that a problem? Well, without the control group, you don't know whether the improvement was caused by the intervention or by maturation. They could have got it better without the feedback. So there had to be one group given feedback and another group not given feedback, tested before and afterwards. Sometimes feedback was combined with an intervention like target setting. So if it's successful, you can't be sure that it was the target setting rather than the feedback that caused the intervention. So they excluded those. Some of them only had 10 participants, fewer than 10 participants. There were a couple of studies from medical education with just one or two participants, and therefore errors of sampling are significant. In other studies, performance was estimated qualitatively rather than quantitatively. So that brings in some subjectivity, which obviously is a danger in terms of interpreting the results. And finally, sometimes not enough details of the size of the impact of feedback was given for the researchers to calculate an effect size. They found just 131 out of the original 3,000 made the cut. There were only 131 reliable studies on the effects of feedback. That was surprising. What was even more surprising was that although on average feedback increased performance, the effect sizes across the studies was very variable. The standard deviation was actually one. And in 50 out of the 131 studies, giving people feedback made their performance worse. This is one of the most counterintuitive results in all of psychology. In every single one of these studies, feedback was intended to improve performance, but in almost 40% of them, you would have been better off shutting up than giving the feedback. So this sounds, I think, as a cautionary tale. Because it is true that on average, feedback improves performance. But if you don't understand what kinds of feedback improve performance, and we encourage teachers to give more feedback because the toolkit says we should give more feedback, you might actually be making things worse. And this is my concern. I, I, I have to say, I think the toolkit is a great piece of engaging teachers with research. The danger is we are treating teachers, in Lawrence Stenhouse's memorable phrase, like intellectual navvies, who are told where to dig, but not why. And the reason that's important is this. The p navvies who don't know what, why they're digging where they are can't make appropriate adjustments if it turns out you can't actually dig exactly where you thought you were going to dig. And in the same way, if you don't understand why you're reproducing an intervention, because it'll never go completely according to plan, you have to make smart, smart adjustments. You have to understand which features of the intervention are really important and which features can actually be let go if implementation is proving difficult. So I want to take you through some, now some of the real problems of meta-analysis. And this is a bit um, mathsy. So I just want to point out that typically, 
meta-analysis uses something called a standardized effect size, which is the difference between how well the experimental group did divided by, you know, subtracted off how well the, the control group did, subtracted off that, and then divided by a measure of spread in the population, and we usually use standard deviation. And I want to draw attention to four problems with meta-analysis. Basically, this is why you should be very skeptical when anybody tells you they've analyzed 6,000 studies and the answer is X. The file draw problem, the fact that some studies don't get published, the variation in population variability, the selection of studies, and how sensitive the measures used in the studies are to the effects of the intervention. So, um, with statistical experiments, we typically have a certain effect we're looking for. So, we have a certain size of effect. If you want a big, if you want a, a, you know, a cast iron proof, you say, I want to be absolutely sure that this is a real result, I'm going to set my significance level at 1%. If you're a bit more exploratory, you might set it at 30%. But the important point is, the more strict you are about your burden of proof, the bigger experiment you need. The size of the effect. Education experiments have small effects. There's a man called Jacob Cohen who wrote a book called Statistical D D Power for the S Social Sciences. And he wrote a book in which he recommended that effect sizes of 0.3, standard deviations, were regarded as small. And therefore, people think that effect sizes of 0.3 are small. In education, they are huge. An effect size of 0.3 in a middle school or a high secondary school would be doubling the speed of student learning. I think doubling the speed of student learning is worth having. And yet, according to the statisticians, that's a small effect size. And of course, then the size of the effect. It turns out that the typical experiment in psychology has, an effect, has a power of 0.4. That means only 40% of the experiments will have produced a significant effect if the effect is as big as the people believe it is. In neuroscience, it's 0.2, and education, we're not quite sure, but it's about 0.4. Here's the important takeaway. Only lucky experiments get published. There's a wonderful cartoon by XKCD which shows somebody researching whether jelly beans cause acne. And he tries it, doesn't work. Then he has another idea. Let's try red jelly beans, doesn't work. Let's try purple jelly beans, doesn't work. Let's try yellow jelly beans, doesn't work. And he tries 20 different experiments with 20 different, and he finds that green works. So he says green jelly beans cause acne. But of course that's exactly what you'd expect if they didn't cause acne and you had a 5% confidence interval, uh, statistical significance level, and you said, okay, we do 20 experiments, one of them will be significant just by chance. If you do enough experiments, you're going to get a significant result. And this is a very big issue in the medical sciences, where Ioannidis uh, has, has pointed out that a large number of the experiments that are actually in the literature are skewed towards the upper end of the distribution. So they over estimate the size of the real impact. Okay, so, okay. so, variation of variability. This shows what one year's growth looks like at different ages. So for a five-year-old, one year's growth is about 1.6 standard deviations. And by the time the kids are in secondary school, it's down below 0.4. Why does that matter? Well, if we had an intervention that increased the rate of student learning by 50%, we'd get an effect size of 0.76 if our experiment happened to get done on five-year-olds. But if we did the same experiment with the same effect on 15-year-olds, we'd get an effect size of 0.1. So the point is that if you put studies with different age students into the same meta-analysis, you're producing garbage because your, your results are uninterpretable. Okay, so, so. so studies with younger children will produce overestimates. Studied, studies with restricted populations, gifted students, special needs students, will also produce biased estimates because now the population standard deviation is restricted. Selection of studies. This is, in some ways, the most disturbing. Um, Maria Ruiz Primo and Min Lee reviewed 9,000 papers on feedback in mathematics, science, and technology. Um, they found that only 238 were actually worth reading. Um, but then they actually looked at those 238 in some detail. 
And here's what's rather extraordinary. They, they, defo they looked at what kinds of feedback was involved. They produced a very nice typology, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. You can read it later. But here's what they looked at. Look at the first row of the, of the table here. Feedback treatment is a single event lasting minutes. 85% of the studies that researched feedback in maths teaching and 72% of the ones in science, the feedback event was a single event lasting minutes. Now, that might be interesting to, psych to psychology professors. Uh, most of these studies were done by psychology professors on their own students. Psychology undergraduates are the most researched species on the planet because professors are lazy and students will do anything for course credit. So the problem is that if you do meta-analysis and you lump together all these studies, some of which were feedback was lasting a minute, and others where teachers were changing the way they were giving feedback to their students over the course of the year, your results are meaningless. And the final one, and maybe, maybe even more importantly, I'm not sure about this, is this thing called sensitivity to instruction. The fact is that different outcome measures differ in how well they capture what it is that teachers change. And so Maria Ruiz Primo and her colleagues developed a typology of what you're asking students to do as an outcome measure. So for example, the immediate one, science journals, a close one. If the experiment is kids working out how long it takes for one swing of the pendulum, a close measure would be how good they are at working out how many per minute. So it's a very, very closely related um, measure. And so these, basically, this is a typology of how far the assessment is away from the thing that was actually taught. And then she, they looked at the effect sizes in different kinds of studies. And I've used a box and whisker diagram. And here you can see that where it's a close measurement, close to the, to the, to the teaching, the, the effect sizes are much bigger than they're for, they're for more distant. So again, the results you get from meta-analyses depend on what kinds of outcome measures are used. That's why I think meta-analyses aren't very useful. And coming back to um, what we need to be doing, I think Aristotle had a thing to say about this. He pointed out that there are three kinds, at least three kinds of intellectual virtue. One he called episteme, the knowledge of timeless universal truths. That's like the base angles of an isosceles triangle are equal. If you prove that yesterday, you don't need to check it today. It's still true. Techne was the ability to make things. There's not one perfect table, There's an, you know, but the ability to make tables is an important intellectual virtue. But he regarded the highest intellectual virtue as phronesis, practical wisdom. And what he pointed out is you often get young people who are precocious at episteme, you hardly ever get people who are precocious in terms of phrenesis. You need to know the science, but you also need to temper it with judgment. Philip Björk pointed out that in education and other social sciences, we tend, we need more f research focus on phrenesis rather than science. We're not going to look at you know, what is the right answer here? We say, where are we going? Is it desirable? What should be done? And I think this actually is very useful for education research. I think the purpose of education research should, in the vast majority of cases, be to move teachers to more effective action. And I'm say, so I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about this. Now, most people think that research can tell teachers what to do. Michael Polanyi, in a very important book written in 1958, pointed out that you can, in, in matters of, of expertise and, and quality in particular, you can't generally tell people what to do. He talked about maxims, and he said, maxims are rules, the correct application of which is part of the art which they govern. The true maxims of golfing or poetry increase our insight into golfing poetry and may even give valuable guidance to golfers and poets. But these maxims would instantly condemn themselves to absurdity if they tried to replace the golfer's skill or the poet's art. Maxims cannot be understood, still less applied, by anyone not already possessing a good practical knowledge of the art. They derive their interest from our appreciation of the art and cannot themselves either replace or establish that appreciation. And that's the research trap we have for teachers. For example, it turns out that teachers, the good teachers, have smooth episodes between transitions in their classrooms. And less effective teachers have chaotic transitions between episodes in their classroom. Do you think telling weak teachers that they need to smooth out the transitions in their classrooms will help? No, it doesn't. Too often, the findings of research 
are descriptions of what good people can already do, and the people who aren't very good can't yet do and don't understand. And this has been appreciated in the world of business under the role of tacit knowledge. And Michael Errow has written lots about this in education. And one model I find particularly helpful is from Nonaka and Takeuchi, two organizational theorists in a book called The Knowledge Creating Company. They proposed that the most important kinds of knowledge in organizations is often ignored because it's tacit. Some, some stuff you know that you know, some stuff you don't know you know. So when somebody has tacit knowledge, sorry, explicit knowledge, and gives it to somebody else, that they call that combination. So if I go to a new school, I say, what time's morning break? And they say 10.55, what time does it finish? 11.15. I now know what they know. Somebody else's explicit knowledge has been given to me as explicit knowledge. Often, however, that's not the truth of the matter. It may be that the official break time end is 11.15, but actually, nobody really worries about it. Teachers get up from the staff room and kind of amble up towards their classroom, but nobody expects anything to start before 11.20. And that's something you pick up, not by being told that, but being socialized into it. So other people's tacit knowledge gets picked up by you as tacit knowledge through a process of socialization. Two other processes that I think are even more powerful, externalization. When I first started having PGC students in my classroom, I wasn't very helpful, because I used to tell them, you'll just, just do what I do, it works for me. <laughs> Partly because I never trained as a teacher, and I was of no help at all. And so, through having PGC students in my classroom, I was forced to think through more clearly what I was doing. I don't know whether it helped them, but it certainly made me a lot better teacher being forced to think through what I was doing, through a process of externalization. And the complementary process is one of internalization, where you take some advice from somebody else, and you think you understand it, and then sometimes, months later, it all clicks into place. I remember Jerry Hardy, a teacher in Christopher Wren School, where I first started, told me I needed to relax. I didn't know what he meant until I suddenly realized that I was being relaxed in my classroom. I wasn't putting on a show anymore. I wasn't putting on a face. It was me. But the point was, I thought I understood it when he told me it. it I didn't really understood it, understand it until I could do it. And so what Nonaka Takeuchi says that if we're serious about respecting knowledge in organizations, we have to nurture all these kinds of knowledge conversion through a process of dialogue, networking, learning by doing, and sharing experience. And the traditional approach of academic research is concerned entirely with the kind of knowledge that goes in the bottom right-hand corner. That's important, but it's not more important than the other kinds of knowledge that teachers have. And I think a paradigm for education research is nicely illustrated by this framework provided by Churchman. Uh, he points out that um, different inquiry systems rely on different things as sources of evidence. So mathematics is the classic example of a Leibnizian inquiry system. Does it, is it correct? Does it follow logically from the, from the uh, axioms? That, that's the kind of thing they do in, in maths. That's a Leibnizian inquiry system. A Lockean one looks at observations and, and compares that with theory. So basically, in a Lockean inquiry system, you make a prediction, you do the experiment, and then you find out which of your possible hypotheses is correct. A Kantian inquiry system understands that there's no such thing as reality. Even Werner von Heisenberg once said, what we learn about in our physics experiments is not the nature of the world itself, but nature exposed to our line of questioning. So basically, what you find out is driven by the questions that you ask. This is taken further in a Hegelian system, whereby you try to tell the strongest story on one side of the argument, and then try to tell the strongest story on the other side of the argument. I often ask people, what would have to be different about the world for you to believe the opposite of what you do believe? If the answer is not very much, then you don't have very strong grounds for your beliefs. And the final one is the Singh Aryan inquiry system, where the bedrock is values, ethics, and practical consequences. So the Lockean inquirer displays the fundamental data that all experts agree are accurate and relevant, and then builds a consistent story out of these. The Kantian inquirer displays the same story from different points of view, emphasizing thereby that what's put into the story by the internal mode of representation is not given from the outside. But the Hegelian inquirer, using the same data, tells two stories. One supporting the most prominent policy on the one side, the other supporting the most promising story on the other side. And I think that's uh, a useful target for educational research. I think, as researchers, we should be trying to marshal evidence that supports the idea that what we want to conclude is, what is, is correct, but we should also be trying to show that plausible rival interpretations of our data are less warranted, and we should constantly be looking at the ethical consequences of these. 
Educational research is not value-free. There's a wonderful example of this. A history student at a university in France was awarded a PhD from a university in which he questioned the historical basis for the Holocaust. So what he was doing in his thesis was saying that the available historical documentation does not support the idea that six million Jews were killed in the Holocaust. And because it was a fairly good piece of history, the PhD thesis was awarded. It was then revoked by the state. The state revoked the award of the PhD thesis, not because it wasn't good history research, but because the whole venture was driven by what they thought was an immoral or unethical purpose. And I thought that was quite an interesting example of the ethical basis for something overriding the claim to knowledge. And the basis for our warrants, the assumptions we make, and the ethical basis for defending these consequences are constantly open to question. So we can make assumptions in our starting points for research. We have to do that because we can't get started. But we also have to accept that the, the, the starting points that we choose for our research are themselves open to question. We should be prepared to research, to defend our choices. Another example from a colleague of mine, Margaret Brown. Many of you will have come across the CSMS research done in the 1970s. One of the things that the CSMS research never did was produce breakdowns by gender. They had the data, they chose not to publish it because they chose that they believed that if they had the gender results, people would fixate on those rather than what they thought were the more important messages about math teaching in general. Now that's a moral choice. What you choose to publish, what you choose not to publish, what you choose to research is a moral choice. That's why I think people in universities who are given time by, through government funding to inquire into education have a moral obligation to pursue things that are relevant to teachers and schools. Not because the truth of knowledge for its own sake isn't a wonderful thing, it is. But the fact is, there's a moral basis, I think, you have to acknowledge. And that's why I think that most educational research should be in Pasteur's quadrant. This is a model developed by Donald Stokes, where he looks at, is there, is there a quest for fundamental understanding? Tycho Brahe didn't bother with a, a fundamental understanding. He just charted the stars. Thomas Edison was doing applied research. Brahe didn't care wh whether the results were used. Edison did, but Edison was always atheoretical. He just wanted to know what, he, what worked. Niels Bohr was completely uninterested by considerations of use. He was just trying to find out the truth about the nature of matter and the nature of the universe. But Pasteur, the argument goes, is use inspired basic research. And I think that should be our aim. We should be trying to work in Pasteur's quadrant. So I think the way we, 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 we undertake educational research should be as follows. I think all teachers should be attempting to improve their practice through a process of disciplined inquiry. I'm not saying that all teachers should do research. I think all teachers should be trying to improve their practice because when teachers do their job better, their students will be healthier, live longer, and contribute more to society. It's that moral imperative. Some may wish to write their work up and share it with others. Some may wish to publish in academic journals. Some may wish to pursue research degrees, and some may even want to become researchers. That's fine. Those are things that teachers can choose to do if they want to. But the non-negotiable, I think, is that every teacher should be improving their practice in their own classrooms. That's not research. Because if the inquiry is conducted in a way that does not transcend the context of data collection, then it's not research. For me, if it only applies in that one teacher's classroom, it's not research. It's disciplined inquiry, I hope, but it's not research. The role of researchers, then, is to help. And Paul Black and I, I think, would own up to the fact that over the last 15 years in formative assessment, we haven't been leading practice we have been following behind the best practitioners, trying to make sense of what they do, trying to theorize it, trying to present it to others in a way that's more accessible. So making, helping teachers make their findings applicable in context other than the context of data collection. So for me, that's the way that research, researchers and teachers can work together. Teachers' job is to get as, as good as they can at their teaching. Some might want to do other things. The job of researchers is to help understand what really works in practice in different contexts, maybe theorize it so it works in different contexts, and then share that with others. Thank you very much.